So thank you for joining me today. And um, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of an introduction so that you can uh, find out more about me and uh, share a little bit about the um, what we will cover today. Um, first of all, my name is Joe Carella, and I'm the Assistant Dean for Executive Education at the University of Arizona. I hold three roles at the college. I'm responsible for our executive development programs, uh, which I'm proud to say have made, uh, have made it to the top 50 rankings in uh, the Financial Times for executive education. Um, I work with my colleagues in career development. Um, our students at University of Arizona are employed by companies like Goldman Sachs, Alibaba, Alcatel, Macy's, in a variety of industries. And uh, through that process, um, I've been able to uh, to work with uh, with many of these uh, corporate uh, organizations and uh, and understand more what they are going through as they select and recruit talent. Um, I also teach corporate strategy. I think that these three lenses give me a unique perspective on how talent is entering the workforce, um, their expectations, and their role in advancing the um, organization's strategy. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, uh, talent is today one of the sources, uh, one of the clear sources of competitive advantage. So what will we cover today? First of all, we'll look at what the digital generation is. Um, we'll also look a little bit at how it differs from previous generations. Um, I'll be engaging you in a bit of, a, uh, of an exercise. I want to get your uh, perspective on a few things. Um, we'll look at some of the differences across the globe. Is the digital generation the same across the globe or are there differences? And if there are, then um, how does that impact us? We will also look at how managing the digital generation globally is a little bit of a paradox in that can we do it globally? Can we do it locally? How do we make sense of uh, this global local paradox and how do we make sense of paradoxes in general? And finally, what practical steps can we take to address the issue? All right, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Let's start with a couple of definitions to get everyone on the same page. I want to make sure that we both have, that we all have the same definitions as to what a digital generation is and um, what also is a paradox. Given that I will be talking about those two things, let's get everyone on the same page and have a clear understanding of what those two things are. Let's start with the digital generation. Digital natives are native speakers of the digital language of uh, computers, video, games, and the internet. That's a definition that um, was um, created and uh, uh, established in uh, 2001 by uh, Professor Pransky. And while I say that, there is no evidence, first of all, that there is a single digital generation. And so that may uh, kind of confuse some of you uh, in that you may be thinking, hang on a second, you're talking about the digital generation, but then you're saying that there isn't a single generation. If we want to look at it from an academic perspective, I think that there's plenty of evidence that points to the fact that it's difficult to talk about um, a single generation. There are lots of differences, and one could argue that um, across the globe, there are differences in the way in which those manifest themselves, but even within country, there are the, uh, for example, the urban rural divides and the differences between, uh, uh, between those. So, for the purposes of our conversation and for the purposes of what companies ultimately have to struggle with, which is to uh, try to generalize as much as they possibly can so that they can create a common strategy, um, I'm going to embrace the, uh, the idea of um, uh, Paul Palfrey's, John Palfrey's, uh, the former director of uh, Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. 
that said that while the term um, it's academically hugely problematic, and I agree with him, uh, it's the kind of term that make, makes interventions possible. And so it makes um, those of us that live in the real world um, do something about the reality that we are experiencing. What's important in this generation and what I want to draw your attention to is this idea of being native speakers of digital language of computers, video games, and the internet. They have essentially grown up with those tools. And the, those tools have, um, for better or for worse, um, impacted the way in which they interact, engage, uh, see reality fundamentally. And um, when we look, for example, at the four universal stages of cognitive development um, that uh, psychologist Jean Piaget um, uh, discussed, um, explored, um, there's really a mental map of the world um, in, uh, um, the, um, in the fourth stage of development, uh, in the fourth stage of development of, uh, of, uh, of a child. Um, that starts at age um, 11 and over, where um, during this period, children carve out general assumptions that shape their adult working lives. So what does that mean? It means that those of us that were born um, prior to the introduction of uh, the diffused introduction of uh, computers video games and the internet have not been so fundamentally shaped by the presence of these tools and these tools have not given us the same perspective on the world as digital natives the digital generation that we're discussing really has um, um, has had and so in that sense, for those of you that may be more familiar with uh, other terms, the, the digital natives are fundamentally those that were born um, in the late part of the millennial generation, if you're familiar with that term, and uh, the, uh, some, some other times Gen Y, and definitely Gen Z generation that is now starting to enter college and it's now starting to also enter the, the workforce. So what I will do after I give you the definition of uh, paradoxes so that we have those two definitions figured out, I will talk about the factors that have impacted um, this generation. All right. So what is a paradox? A paradox or a management dilemma occurs when we are faced with a situation that has no real long-term solution. It essentially requires keeping two or more opposing or conflicting forces in, uh, in balance. They're sometimes described as dilemmas, conundrums, polarities, competing values or contradictions, and seem to defy common sense and business acumen. They can be overwhelming, they can be difficult to understand, and they seem to be impossible to address from a certain perspective. The common business models and tools that we tend to use in those environments are not very useful in managing paradoxes because they seem to address a problem that has already been identified and for which a specific course of action is possible. A paradox is not something that you can uh, find a direct solution to and definitely not a long-term solution and we will explore that. We will keep going from holding one uh, perspective on it and thinking that it's right to shifting to another perspective that seems just as equally compelling and that is fundamentally the opposite of what we were doing before. So without the ability of uh, holding competing interests in mind, organizations 
unfortunately risk uh, losing sight of the wisdom and opportunities that emerge when pursuing paradoxical thinking. So to me, the important part here is recognizing that there are some paradoxes, that those paradoxes apply to the digital generation and the way that we go about engaging the digital generation, and that fundamentally there isn't a long-term solution to these paradoxes, but there is a way to manage them. And so let's explore that a little bit more now that we've addressed the two definitions. Context really matters. We look at things from different perspectives based on who we are and what we do. And so before we can tackle the issue of how does the digital, how do we engage the digital generation? How do we manage their um, engagement in the workforce? Do we do it locally? Do we do it globally? Before we do that, it's important that we talk about context. And so our different perspectives do really matter. Um, if you look at the gentleman in the top um, right hand uh, corner, his perspective is not that great to be able to assess what this elephant is about, right? While if you look at the uh, gentleman in the middle left hand corner, well, he probably can start to figure out and have a better perspective than, uh, than others can. So in... Uh, Making an assessment of uh, um, the di digital generation, one thing that it's always good to do to start with is to think about the ways in which bias plays a role in the way in which we make decisions ourselves. And also, it's helpful to recognize that bias, even though it's surfacing more and it's more obvious to us, um, it's becoming uh, more predominant in the world in which we live in. And it's a world that, that seems increasingly unable to reconcile differences. So how do we make sense of what seem to be unresolvable dilemmas? And are there some best practices that we can follow? Let's find out. I'm gonna start by saying that um, as I was mentioning earlier, the paradoxes are ne normally never resolved in time. The first thing that we should do then is just to take a snapshot and see where we're at. Um, I think that a good starting point is to say, um, and I think it's a, it's a well-known accepted fact, that we are essentially living in two, um, what seem to be at a very simple level, two different worlds. One which is made of the developed um, uh, economies and the other one which is made of the advancing economies. They have, um, if we want to start to bring some, uh, uh, some generalization to this and uh, um, looking at the research that is available out there, um, there seems to be two different ways in which the digital generation is evolving in those contexts. In the advancing economies, what we're seeing more of is a move towards individualism, but yet still tempered by the importance of national culture. Um, essentially, what we're saying is that um, because um, the digital generation in the, um, uh, in the advancing economies is experiencing higher levels of uh, uh, economic um, well, uh, wealth, um, it is possible for those individuals to explore more of their specific needs as opposed to um, the collective needs of the group that they belong to. But yet, national culture still plays a role. The, the importance of national pride, the importance of uh, the, um, the direction that the country takes seems to have still an important role. Having said that, there is a tendency to move towards a middle ground where flexibility, um, the importance of the culture of work, the commitment to work, and the value of authentic true leadership is increasingly valued. 
let's take a look at the developed world. In the developed world, there is a different um, approach that it's uh, that it's emerging. Um, a culture that has traditionally been more steeped in individualism, and so um, just like their parents, the digital generation has been brought up in an environment in which the self is um, uh, often more important than the group. Um, they are, in fact, moving more towards a culture of collaboration and discovering more the benefits of working as a group. And at the same time, they are also experiencing more the need to balance um, their work life. Their parents have worked very hard. They have provided for their children and um, especially after the um, Great Recession of 2009, they have uh, increasingly been questioning whether this dedication to work, um, like their parents have, is really conducive to a healthy life. So they're coming at things from different perspectives. What's really interesting, though, is that the research that has been done at University of Southern California, at London Business School, and uh, more recently at our university, says that it doesn't matter where these individuals are at, all of them have been impacted deeply by the 2009 recession. So there are, both groups are generally restrained and responsible. They may be for different reasons, but both are, both groups are, both from the advancing and from the developed um, economies. They see connectivity as a basic notion. It's the basis for how people meet, um, express ideas, and understand each other. Technology is not just a way of doing things faster, which is what my generation and the previous generation may be looking at as far as technology is concerned, but it's actually a way of life. They enjoy anonymity and privacy because they are wired by technology. They choose when to use it and when to opt out. For many of you, this may seem like a contradictory statement, um, but yet if you look at how they um, access technology and for example, their reluctance to embrace platforms that may um, expose them uh, continuously. And uh, to many, it's not a surprise, for example, that this, um, the digital natives and the, um, uh, and in general, so across millennials and, uh, and uh, Gen Z, um, they're not the biggest users, for example, of uh, Facebook that has been a uh, fundamentally a uh, very uh, intrusive platform from a certain perspective. Um, the thing that it's also really interesting and that we find common to them is that they are, both groups are witnessing their, the global leaders inability to tackle big issues. If you look at um, where we're at in the world and the challenges that we're having in uh, sort of coming together to resolve uh, some of the big issues that um, uh, our world seems to have right now. Um, they're watching their leaders um, kind of take a stance that is more uh, particular, um, more um, uh, nationalistic from a certain perspective. And um, they're asking themselves, is it our responsibility to solve some of these problems? And if so, um, for example, are we going to ask ourselves whether smart cities are a good idea and if we can live in and promote a sustainable world? Purpose in substance is very important to them. And that's where the, um, the idea of commitment to work and true leadership really kind of come together and, uh, and sort of um, play an important role in the life of uh, this digital generation. There's an, another interesting point, um, a recent research that was done by Mercer that kind of uh, clearly points to that. 
they're looking for transformational leadership. And so they're looking at themselves as potentially transformational leaders. Um, Mercer collected, um, uh, it's an HR consultancy for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, collected um, data from 600,000 employees um, across 43 countries in hundreds of organizations. And most millennials look to transformational leaders as a positive thing. So there is a desire to change things. Um, and they see these transformational leaders as um, able to positively influence their careers, their work life satisfactions, uh, satisfaction factors that um, this generation pays attention to. So, the challenge for um, talent recruitment organizations and talent development organizations then becomes how do we do this? How do we get to them? Um, there seems to be some common traits that they seem to have, but also they seem to be coming at things from different perspectives. And in general, what um, we tend to see is that it's essentially a paradox, and paradoxes are natural in business. Companies today are being asked to be global and local, to be centralized and have a central view of the organization, but then also be decentralized so that things can be done uh, in uh, uh, more effectively and, uh, and more rapidly at the local level. Um, there is um, the expectation that we can deliver quality, but there's also the expectation that we can deliver cost. There is a drive for results, but there's also the empowerment of people. These tensions shows up, show up in all facets of, the, um, of our organization's lives. Um, leadership, uh, control versus empowerment, teamwork, tasks versus relationships, uh, strategy in terms of competition and collaboration, and within ourselves, work versus home. So when you think of um, uh, paradoxes and paradoxes that apply to talent management, what would you say are some that apply to talent management, talent acquisition? I'd like, if you don't mind, um, to write down some in the chat um, so that we can take a look and see what your thoughts are. And I will also offer a couple um, just as we go along. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to write down in the chat. And Ackerhearth team, I don't know that I see the chat results. So if you don't mind uh, filling me in and telling me what um, what's coming up that would be very helpful all right one that has been sent to me privately in the chat is um, related to common standards and flexible approaches um, it's an idea that it's um, fundamental to the way in which we do talent development talent recruitment is the desire to have uh, some uh, uh, common uh, traits, skills, um, uh, abilities that we're recruiting uh, for uh, that are common across the entire organization so that we can um, essentially manage our workforce and then uh, uh, um, promote them, um, uh, offer the, uh, the, the right set of benefits, um, and uh, um, essentially drive um, the uh, similar approach to the work that they do. But then there is the local realities of um, uh, what's available, um, the type of skills that people are being trained for um, that makes it harder to create a common approach. So that's one example of a, um, of a paradox that applies to uh, talent recruitment. So how do we solve this? There are many, many ways to uh, map and manage paradoxes. And uh, the, um, the, the fundamental point here is that it's a, a end both um, versus a either or thinking. Um, 
those that uh, struggle with the managing paradoxes think of it as an either or, uh, as opposed to an and both. And so the picture that I'm presenting here really sort of uh, gives you a um, uh, one of those examples of uh, how paradoxes for us are difficult to resolve even um, at the um, um, at the um, at a very basic level. Um, our eyes and our brain trick us into thinking that we need to uh, find a solution to everything that we um, that we encounter. And the reality is that sometimes we can't. So in the picture that I am projecting here, you could see one thing, um, and that one thing could be, for example, an old lady. You can see that there is a um, white, uh, the white hair, and she's wearing some kind of uh, headband. Um, she has a big nose. She's wearing um, uh, she's wearing a uh, fur coat. Um, she has some very narrow lips. Um, and um, we might look at her uh, with, uh, with that sort of um, perspective. But then we could also look at the picture in a different way, which is we could see a young lady whose face is turning away. What were the narrow lips, the narrow red lips are actually the neck of the lady with a choker, uh, a little necklace uh, that she's wearing. And what was the brown headband is in fact the brown hair of the lady, and she's wearing a white veil on, on top of her head. So we could look at things differently. The reality is that those of us that are able to accept paradoxes can easily shift from seeing the old lady and seeing the young lady and being okay with it. The important part is the being okay with it. Being okay that our reality is more complex than our brain would like us to, uh, to make it look, and um, that we can hold two opposing views at once. There have been multiple ways in which um, paradoxes have been resolved. The one that I... Um, and two examples, for example, are polarity mapping. Uh, it's a framework that was created by Barry Johnson. There's also uh, duality mapping that draws from uh, um, the concepts of uh, yin and yang. Um, it, you can, uh, you can uh, research those and uh, spend more time on those. The one that I'm going to propose to you and that I think kind of applies best is um, a model that instead maps paradoxes according to the value of the concerns that they have to us. So I'm gonna pick the global local, which is the whole point of our conversation today. And what I'm gonna to suggest to you is that essentially, both the global and local um, dimensions of looking at things have values to them and concerns to them. Let's take a look at global. The value of taking a global approach to things is that it allows for economies of scale. It allows us to better manage our brand. Yet, when we look at local, um, it has concerns too, in that um, if we're being um, focused on um, kind of universal principles um, that apply across the board and that don't really uh, take into consideration the, um, the local concerns, then you tend to have local alienation, um, inadequate information, because essentially we don't, we're not able to uh, worry about the differences, the local differences. And let's move across the spectrum to the right hand side. If we instead focus on local, the value to us is the candidate responsiveness. We're able to be responsive to our candidates for the, uh, um, for the uh, recruitment efforts that we're trying to make. Um, more effectively, uh, we are able to respond in a language that they understand. Uh, we're able to better match um, the uh, local cultural sensitivities. 
but it has some concerns, right? In that if we are tailoring everything for our local environments, then it's going to cost us more and we're not able to access best practices. So how do we solve paradoxes? Well, in a sense, we can never solve paradoxes. And what we can do is to essentially move continuously from this valuing local, valuing global, um, being concerned by local and being concerned by global. And you can almost see how we go into a figure eight um, ad infinitum um, uh, flow where we, for example, consider the fact that global is not working for us. It's alienating um, the, the local environment. And so we need to move instead to local. And so we become more responsive to our candidates, but then our costs increases. So we try to offset that by instead uh, trying to drive our economies of scale and doing things in a standardized manner. And then we go back into alienating our local uh, clients and uh, so on and so forth. You can see how it's a continuous cycle shifting from one to the other. So how do we solve it? For starters, one of the important things that we need to go back to is what is universal? What are universal principles that apply across the board? We've discussed some of those. And um, when we were looking at the digital generation and we found that even though there were differences um, from uh, between developing economies, uh, advancing economies and uh, developed economies, even though there were some differences, there were some traits that were common to uh, the digital generation, no matter where they were. So what we need to do then is to ask ourselves, first of all, what is universal? What are some of the principles that hold us all together? And focus on that and identify that as our first step. We then need to really worry about the values that both set of paradoxes really offer. So can we try and maximize our economies of scale and candidate responsiveness at the same time? Can we create a global brand and still create um, an environment where local sensitivities are translated and reflected locally? The point of managing paradoxes, just like with the picture of the lady, is not so much to eliminate them, but actually to draw the value that we get from both sets of experiences. And in the process, then as a step three, minimize the concerns that both sets have. Are there ways that we can reduce local alienation? Are there ways in which we can manage costs so that they don't spiral out of control? In order to do that, we need to ask ourselves first, what is universal? What is that holds us all together? Then we engage into a dialogue that says, how can I maximize the value of both experiences? And then we look at minimizing the concerns that we might have. So essentially, for us as managers of paradoxes and all of us that are involved in uh, uh, global talent initiatives, the, um, the point is, how do we do both? How do we drive um, the um, global value that we can get from the management of paradoxes? And how do we reduce the concerns that um, that, that uh, presents? And the same at the local level. So I'm going to focus on uh, specifically on five principles for talent attraction that I've seen work. And so what is universal? My recommendation to you, given that we have um, limited time today, is to uh, then do this little exercise in your own time and start to move beyond the universal and principles that you can apply today to uh, the step two. And so how do I do some of the things that may help me be local and global at once? And then 
uh, go through a step three in terms of minimizing concerns. So here are some principles that um, I've seen that, uh, that work in talent attraction and that reflect if those five universal principles that are of value to the digital generation. Number one, digital talent is looking for meaningful work. They are not, in that sense, dissimilar from the previous generations. Previous generations thought that purpose of work was equally important. What's really different here is that for the digital generation, purpose of work is just as important as their salary. And so here, I want you to hear me out. Um, what we see, it's not just that um, they are ready to come to work and they're ready to make a difference um, and don't want to get paid. They want to get paid just as much as their uh, uh, parents were. The emphasis, though, is that they're not prepared to do so without um, having purpose attached to it. A company that I've found that uh, really does this well for the, um, uh, for the digital generation and why it appears so frequently as one of the largest recruiter of um, uh, digital talent, uh, digital generation talent, is Salesforce. They do this in several ways. They have Chatter, which is the, their internal social network. They have V2MOM, which is a really unusual name to um, an acronym that stands for Values, Vision, Methods, Obstacles, and Measures, um, which essentially tries to bring all of the employees um, in alignment uh, around where is that the company is trying to go and how does it impact the community and the society that they're part of. Um, there is a lot more purpose and effort there, as well as um, the fact that um, there are plenty of opportunities, for example, for employees to contribute, to offer uh, perspective, to, uh, to influence what's being done uh, in the organization in the form of the company's whole hands meetings. And it really creates an opportunity for the employees to feel connected to the company, be fulfilled in their roles, and see a path for professional development. Number two is transparency. Um, a company that I think does this really well is Zalando. It's a um, uh, fashion online retailer. Uh, they will tell you that they do more than that. I'm oversimplifying, I, uh, I'll admit. Um, but essentially, they are very specific in their um, efforts to allow all employees to speak up and to create impact. Um, so transparency is really important to this generation. Uh, the transparency when it comes to how things are run, how the organization uh, creates impact. And Zalando is... Um, uh, at the forefront in Europe in, uh, uh, in trying to drive that. Happiness at work. If, the, if um, this generation is not content uh, at work, they, uh, they will think that they can do better and they will move on. Um, what I've noticed, for example, is that companies like DBS are very much trying to be, um, for example, uh, similar to um, some of the new breed of millennial-led Singaporean-based uh, companies like Razor, Carousel, um, maybe Redmart as well, um, and uh, are trying to do the best to keep people engaged at work, happy at work, which means, uh, which doesn't mean just providing uh, nice perks, but it means championing disruption, leveraging technology, finding ways for um, the digital generation that is a really hands-on generation to have a, a, to make a contribution early on. Um, they're itching, this generation is itching to make a contribution, is very hands-on, 
and wants to uh, to have impact right away. So happiness at work is is a bigger construct than that. Number four, uh, we've been talking about the fact that this generation is um, really thinks of technology not not just as an, an enabler but as a way of being. Uh, a good example there for me is McDonald's. Um, this generation, even though is really good with technology is not as good for example at picking uh, subtle non-verbal clues there's plenty of research that points to the fact that when they're placed in a face-to-face uh, -face environment uh, physical environment they are really not good at uh, seeing what's happening around them and they're looking for more context um, mcdonald's for example has um, been creating, has been engaging um, uh, participants on Snapchat, uh, participants, potential talent on, uh, on Snapchat. And we're trying to recruit on Snapchat by creating 10 second video ads um, of their employees, essentially testimonials that showcase what it's like to work at McDonald's and what the advantages are and uh, all the, the value that you can get out of a career at, at McDonald's. Seems bizarre, but for this generation, that holds way more value than a one hour long career fair uh, interview um, and the opportunity to flexibly decide if they want to interview or not and to make so on the basis of a context that is uh, much richer because of the richer experience that you can get through uh, the technology and ease of access that you can get uh, through them wanting to follow through and look for information that it's relevant to you. And so in that sense, um, it creates, as far as the digital generation is concerned, a much richer experience. The final part is um, organization, the way in which the organization is structured. An important and critical part that I think many uh, talent managers, talent recruiters struggle with is that traditional organizational boundaries make no sense to the digital generation. Um, there's research at University of Washington that says the digital na natives learn from experience rather than instruction, respect for others is earned rather than authority, and they expect information access for all. While this may vary to differing degrees according to the country in which you are, um, how do you make sense from a, um, of this from a recruitment perspective? Um, are you still, um, my question to you would be, are you still recruiting with a narrow functional mindset? Um, and if you look at industries that are um, maybe more traditional in that approach, you'll see that those are the top declining industries for digital job, uh, for digital generation job switchers. Um, retail, government, oil and energy and telecommunications are not industries that are being particularly favored by this generation, essentially because those organizational boundaries are very strict and they feel limiting. Take Zappos instead, that has championed the idea of holacracy, i.e. we work as teams, we all contribute, um, meritocracy is what's gonna get us there, and uh, if you can demonstrate your skills pretty quickly, you're going to get um, advanced in the organization and given responsibility more quickly. Um, there's plenty of research that says that holacracy does not always necessarily work, but there's maybe a happy medium here. Again, in, uh, in managing priorities, what are you doing to try to minimize the disadvantages, for example, of making a digital uh, native feel, a digital generation feel constrained by your organizational boundaries versus giving them the flexibility to test and try new things. In substance, and I'm going to wrap this up here, and then I will allow for some uh, some questions if you have any. If I were to give you one uh, single piece of advice is stop chasing them, stop chasing the digital generation, and start engaging them. Engaging means connecting with them where they're at, 
and speaking to them in a language that they recognize and understand. Ultimately, they will be your bosses and your bosses' bosses in the years to come. So wouldn't it be better to be connected with them in a different way than uh, my way or the highway? I look forward to your, com uh, uh, your comments and uh, thank you for listening uh, to my, um, my thoughts on uh, the digital generation. Thank you. And by the way, here are my contact details in case you want to connect with me more personally, I'll be happy to engage you. All right. One question that I have received that I wanted to bring up is um, how does the um, how do we optimize a talent pipeline? Well, it's a very broad question, and I think that the um, the reality is actually very um, different according to the organization that you are uh, uh, responsible for. For me, one of the uh, key um, drivers of, um, of success in uh, building a strong talent pipeline is how do you think of the digital generation? And so it goes back to one of the earlier points that I had made um, when we first started, um, which is, do you understand the context? Do you understand the bias that you personally have and how that plays out in the way in which you engage this generation? And are you meeting them where they're at? Um, one thing that is really interesting is that um, uh, you will be surprised or not be surprised to know that not everyone is actually on LinkedIn, right? And so I see many organizations now having completely flattened their uh, talent recruitment, talent uh, engagement um, efforts uh, through uh, by looking for talent on LinkedIn. Guess what? Everyone else is too. And so are there, for example, platforms that are specifically used by the um, group that you're trying to recruit for? And um, for example, lawyers, um, doctors are not big users of LinkedIn. Where do they, um, where do you recruit them? And if I think of the specifics um, of uh, talent that you could be recruiting through um, for, um, uh, for calling purposes, where would you find them? What are some of the uh, uh, coding communities where you could uh, in fact engage them more, uh, more directly and more proactively? Um, and what sort of uh, conversation are you having with them as opposed to um, kind of chasing them and offering them perks? Are you engaging them in a dialogue that says, hey, here are the three things that we want to work on that are really exciting for which we have no solution and we're looking for talent to help us develop those? Is that the conversation that you're having or are you having a conversation that says, here are all the perks that we offer come for an interview and then find that you're not as engaged as you thought you would. Okay, looks like we have no other questions right now. I am just going to um, uh, wrap this up by saying thank you for attending. And um, like I said, I'll be more than happy to um, take your questions offline if you want to. Um, if there is any questions that you have on what I've shared so far, I would be delighted to discuss this separately. You can contact me at Carella at email.arizona.edu. Um, be more than happy to do so. I'm sure also that the Acker Earth team will be delighted to take your questions and engage you um, that way as well. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you for being a part of this. And I look forward to connecting with you and to continue the dialogue on the digital generation. They have a lot to teach us and we have a lot to offer to them. So it's a two-way street. Thank you.